Jesus came, the Word of God in flesh. He came to bring new life. And from heaven he was sown. He took the form of a servant, our King, our hope. us the secrets of heaven. He healed the sick. He restored the outcasts. He showed us love. He was God with us. But we rejected him. We nailed him to a cross. A cross that we deserved. He died in our place, and like a seed, he was buried, and death could not hold him. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go. Tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he said.
high in this place For our King stands over the grave Yes, He does So let praise rise high in this place For our King stands over the grave Sing it out Shake 
Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven, and to all the rest. Now, it was Mary Magdalene, and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Now 
sing we lift high
for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins.
He is risen. Turn to the person closest to you and say, he is risen indeed. Happy Resurrection Day, Life Center Church. He is risen. And you probably saw this coming today. But today concludes our ongoing series that's been entitled, From the Ground Up. And our culminating message to you over the past few weeks as a team has led to this moment right now. And we've called this series, as I just said, From the Ground Up. Focusing on parables that have earthy imagery with, with soil and with seeds and with growing things. Hence, the jungle on the platform that you've had to endure for the past few weeks. It's gone along with our theme. For the kingdom of God is likened unto these things. Soil, seeds, growing things, trees, plants. And in just a few minutes... We're going to discover why. See, Andy kicked off our series with the parable of the mustard seed. And it's about small things turning into great big things. And Andy talked about the parable of the growing seed. Emily with the parable of the sower. Michael with the God of the vineyard, the parable of the tenants. And myself with the parable of the two sons who were sent to work in the Father's vineyard. And our final word to you in this series is this right here. From the ground up, he is risen. Matthew 12, 14 says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights into the heart of the earth like a little seed buried in the ground. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and it dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it will bring forth much fruit. And because of his death, we are the fruit that he desired, the fruit that he produced as a result of his death. The death of the only begotten Son of God brought about our adoption as the sons and the daughters of God. Romans 8.29 says that for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, And by him are all things to bring to him many sons to glory and to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and us who are being sanctified are all one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call us his brethren. And we are his brethren because he entered into our suffering. And he shared in our suffering. He is the captain of our salvation because of what he suffered. He had to be made like us. He had to be made like his brethren in every respect, the Bible says, in order that he might become a faithful and a merciful high priest in service to God as our mediator. In order to make propitiation for the sins of the people. He had to be made like his brethren. He had to be made to suffer, to share in our hurt, our pain, our suffering. He had to taste death for us that he might become the captain of our salvation. In other words, he couldn't have died for our sins if he wasn't made like us. He couldn't have died for our sins if he wasn't made like his brethren. And if Christ never suffered, then Christ was never truly human. See, for suffering is a fundamental human experience. There is not one of us who has not tasted suffering, who has not tasted death in one form or another, or sickness, or hurt, or pain, or agony, or loneliness, depression, physical suffering, infirmity, disease. We've all felt 
the effects of suffering. We've all tasted it. For God to be truly human in, in the incarnation in Christ Jesus, this experience must also be his experience. And you see that this is exactly how God proved to us that he is in fact with us. This is how he proved that he did not abandon us to our suffering. See, people often question God when they go through sufferings. They ask that if there really is a loving God, then, then why do bad things happen to people? Why does a good God allow suffering? Why did he let this happen to me? Where is God? Where is God right now in the midst of this quarantine? Where is God in coronavirus? Here's the reality. God does allow suffering. And God is so good and so wise that he does not hide suffering from the conversation that he's having with us, his brethren, about faith in him and about our journey on this earth. You see, Jesus did not hide suffering from his followers, not at all. In fact, the very criteria of his invitation to follow him was for them to take up their cross and to follow him. Think of it. We cannot ask the question, how could a good God allow bad things to happen to me? Not when God did not even spare his only begotten son. And if he spared not his only son, why should we or anyone think that we would be exempt from the human condition, exempt from pain and exempt from suffering. When we see the image of God on the cross of Calvary, why should we think that we are above suffering? No, friends, not so. For God's ways truly are higher than our ways. And God shows us that he is with us, not by keeping us from suffering and sheltering us from suffering, how does he do it then? By jumping into the trenches of life with us and suffering alongside us as the captain of our salvation. He is made perfect through suffering. He can now identify with us and sympathize with our weakness. We can identify with him. We can identify in his suffering at the cross. You see, Jesus he identifies with us. And really when he prays that prayer on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was feeling the weight of the abandonment of God. It seemed like God had forsaken him and left him alone, abandoned him to torment, abandoned him to death, abandoned him to the grave and left to the mercy of those who scorn and mock and persecute and torture and even kill him upon the cross. He was praying the prayer that David had prayed. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yes, that was the prayer of our Lord. But really, that's our prayer. What he was doing was not just praying for himself, but he was praying our prayer that we have prayed so many times when we have said, God, where are you in the middle of this? Where were you when so-and-so died? Where were you when this happened to me? Jesus was praying our prayer, friends. He identifies with our sense of abandonment and forsakenness by God. He knows what that's like to feel that. Did God show up and pull him off the cross as, a, as his mockers spurned and said, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. If you are the son of God, let God come and save you. Did God do that? Did God rescue him from the cross? Did he take the cup away from Christ that he might not drink it? No. Christ did drink from that cup. And God did not pull him off of that cross. He died there. And Jesus was buried 
in a tomb. Seemingly to all who witnessed these events, a man cursed upon a tree, a man cursed and forsaken, rejected by God, and buried in a tomb. And it was just when it couldn't get any more grim. He was already dead for crying out loud. Hope was totally lost. There can't be, an, there can't be a happy ending here. And just then, when it couldn't get worse, God showed that he did not abandon his son to the grave. That Jesus, even though he prayed that prayer, why have you forsaken me? The reality was that he was not forsaken by his father. God had not abandoned him to the grave. For he was raised to life again. And he walked right out of that tomb. And he left it empty. He left the tomb empty. He left it barren. He left it desolate. You see, the grave had been ravaged by him. He had, he had stripped it of its power. He had stripped it of its authority. He would taken away any dignity that it might have had. You see, if death were like a city for the taking, its monuments and its structures would be the bones the men that it has claimed and the women that lay there. Its trophies would be the bodies of those that it has conquered and those whom it has enslaved. But here's the good news. Jesus sacked that city. He emerged victorious, not empty-handed. You see, Jesus, when he left that tomb empty, he didn't escape death. He didn't, he didn't leave by the skin of his teeth and barely make it out alive. He didn't emerge from the tomb empty-handed. But he emerged victorious. Not empty-handed, but in his hands he held the keys. The keys of hell and death. As the scripture says, O grave, where is your victory? In death, where is your sting? He had conquered death. He had not just escaped the grave he had triumphed over the grave. He had totally conquered and subdued the grave. And he had subjected it to his own authority. For there is no name under heaven that's higher than his name. His name is a name given to among men. It's the only name given among men by which we must be saved. And it is the name that is far above every name. Far above everything that is exalted. Anything that seems to be of worth. Anything that seems to be of something. Anything that seems to be of repute. Anything that might seem to have power, authority over, over thrones, over principalities, over dominions, over angels, over demons, over heaven, over the earth, and over everything underneath the earth. And yes, over the grave. The grave is subject to Jesus when he emerged victorious, when he conquered death, and he held the keys of hell and death in his hands. Now death is put under his feet. And he triumphed over it. And this is how we know this right here, this act that God did, the act of not forsaking his son into the grave, not abandoning Jesus, this is how we know that God has not abandoned us. This is our sign. This is the sign that God has given to us, that he has not forsaken us. That he's not left us to our suffering, to toil in the dirt of this earth, to our pain, to our abandonment, to sickness, to infirmities, to disease, and to death. How do we know that God has not abandoned us? Because he raised Jesus from the grave. Because he did not abandon his son to the grave, just as he rose Christ, we know that he will also, he will also raise us as he has promised how do we know? Because he already did it. Because he did, in fact, raise Jesus. We know that he's good for his word. That his promises to us are yes and amen. And when he says to us that we who believe in him shall have eternal life, we know that the grave will not keep us down. That the grave will not hold us. 
because he raised his one and only son on Easter Sunday. What a glorious day. Praise God wherever you're at right now. If you're watching and you've been saved, you have eternal life, I want you to just praise God right now where you're at with your family members. Hallelujah. You see, God's final say was not suffering. His final say was not defeat. His final say was not death. His final say was life everlasting. His final word to us is freedom. Freedom of fear. Freedom of bondage. The fear of death. Bondage to sin. No longer does sin and death keep us bound in fear and control our actions. But now we've been set free, knowing that he has conquered death, and we need not fear death. But we can lose our lives now for his sake. And in him we know that we will find life everlasting. We have freedom over sin. We don't have to be bound anymore. See, I've built my life, my whole life that I've constructed, I've built it upon that empty tomb. I've built my marriage upon that empty tomb. My hope in the future is based upon that empty tomb. I live my life daily as a result of the reality of that empty tomb. And you might ask, if you're watching, how do you know that there's a God? How do you know that there's life after death? How do you know that you will live again? How do you know that God will raise you up from the grave? The answer is simple. Because of the empty tomb. Because the Spirit of God who raised Christ from the dead lives in me. And because he lives, I will live also. For Jesus said, I am the resurrection. If anyone believes in me, though he may die, yet he will live. There ain't no grave going to hold me down, someone once said. And I know that no grave will hold me when he calls my name. When the trumpet blows, I know that I will emerge to newness of life. And no grave can hold you. This morning, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, that promise extends to you right now. That no grave can hold you. No grave. Not the grave of alcoholism. Not the grave of addiction. Not the grave of pornography. Not the grave of depression, not the grave of loneliness, and not the grave. Not even death itself can separate you from the love of God. He's your ever-present help in time of need. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He won't abandon you to death, and he won't abandon you to your suffering. For in that he himself suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are suffering and being tempted. If you're listening to this today and you're suffering or you're afraid to die, know that he will come to your aid should you call upon his name. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. And his victory is yours today. All you need to do is accept it. It's as easy as that. You see, all of humanity's hope collectively as a race, as a species over the years, all of our hopes and all of humanity's fears are met on this day 2,000 years ago. The most significant moment in all of human history See, the future of the human race depends upon this one truth. The ultimate destiny of mankind is realized in this. The empty tomb of Jesus Christ. The door of history swings on the hinge that is the empty tomb. For Paul says, 
And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your faith, your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found to be false witnesses of God because if we have testified that God had raised up Christ, whom he in fact did not raise, if in fact the dead do not rise, then he did not raise up Christ. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is meaningless. Your faith is futile. You're squandering your days. What are you doing? Doing all this church stuff. What are you doing? Living the way that you live. Depriving yourself of earthly pleasures. What's the point? If Christ be not raised. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. And you're still in your sins. You've not been set free. You're still in bondage. Then also... Those of us who've fallen asleep in Christ, we have truly perished. Our loved ones who've gone on before us have not gone to be with the Lord. They've died. They've totally perished. Paul says, if Christ be not raised, then this is the reality. Verse 19, he says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, if Christ is only for this reality, for this life only, then we among men are to be pitied above all. We are most pitiable among people if Christ is not raised. But now, Christ is risen from the dead, and he has become the first, first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Praise God. Christ is risen, and he has risen indeed. And indeed, our faith is not futile. And those of us who have fallen asleep are presently with the Lord. And we know that we who remain one day will be caught up together with them in the air and meet the Lord and be with him for all of time. It's this message that lets hope begin to rise. It's this message that allows faith to arise. And upon hearing this news, faith is born. For the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And this is the word of God to you this morning. The word of God is Christ crucified and Christ risen. This message is God's holy, infallible, and inerrant message to you. The death, burial, and resurrection of his one and only son, Jesus Christ. This is the good news that God has for us. And it's the preaching of this very gospel that leads to the salvation of mankind. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. And God was pleased through the foolishness of what was being preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks, they look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. And it's a stumbling block to the Jews. And it's foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Greeks and Jews, Christ is both the power of God and the wisdom of God. And it's around this message, this news that I'm telling you this morning, this gospel and not any other that we gather together. It's around this message that we unite together and we stand together as one. Because of this, we join ourselves to each other, and our fellowship is in him. For we are united together in the likeness of his death and in the likeness of his sufferings. And even so, we are united together in his resurrection. So as I finish this message, if you're listening today and you need Jesus, the key to eternal life is to embrace death. Ouch, harsh statement. What do I mean by that? See, there is no Easter 
without Good Friday. There's no resurrection without a crucifixion. Embrace his death for you, that you be saved and receive eternal life. Know that his death should have been your death and cling to that old rugged cross. Lose your life there at the foot of Calvary. And his life there he will give to you. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. If you want to share in his victory, you must share in his suffering. The key to victory is death. Revelation tells us that the way that the saints triumphed over Satan was by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of their testimony. For they loved not their own lives, even unto death. They did not shrink back from death when it was presented to them. It could not deter them from their course, just as Christ could not be deterred from his course when he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem, marching towards his own death. He did not shrink from it. This is how the saints overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, because we, not, we love not our lives even unto death. Jesus tells us that whoever would save his life, cling to his own life, his own will, his own way, that he will lose it. But whoever loses his life for his sake, he will find it. And he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and then follow after me. If you would follow after Jesus today, he bids us to come and die, to lay down our old self and to repent of our sins. Be born again in the newness of his resurrection life and his victory over death, over sin, over the grave will be yours today. Put your faith in the empty tomb of Christ. Build your life upon that rock from the ground up. If that's you today and you want to make Jesus Lord of your life, if you want to put your faith and your trust in him, if you want to cling to his cross and share in his sufferings, identify with him in the, in the act of laying down your own life, what do I mean? Turn from your sins. Repent of your sins and turn towards faith in God. And you will be born again. And he will put his spirit in you. And you will have the resurrection power, resurrection life within you. And his promises to you are sure. And the act that he raised Christ up from the dead, that hope, that same hope you have, eternal life is yours, as he promises us in the most famous passage of scripture. All of you probably know it, John 3, 16. That's available for you today. If you're not sure if you're saved, if you're not sure you know Jesus, if you're not sure you're going to heaven, if you're not sure that when the trumpet blows that you will raise from the grave also as Christ has done. It's really simple. You can be sure of that right now. If you've believed what I have heard, what, what you have heard me say to you today, if you believe this message that I'm telling you and you accept that message as true, as good news, and I want to leave you in a prayer. And if you say this prayer and believe it with your heart, the Bible says that you are saved and eternal life is yours today. If that's you, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. And I ask that you please humble yourself. Pray this prayer with me and just simply repeat after me. It's as easy as that. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose again I believe that you came to suffer and die, to identify with me. I believe that you shared in my sufferings and you showed me the way to God. 
you showed me that God will not forsake me, that God will not abandon me, but that God would save me and give me eternal life. I believe in you. I make you Lord of my life. Come into my life today, I pray. Fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you give me newness of life. Set me free of my sin today. I repent of my sins. And I turn to faith in God today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, they are a new creation. The, the old, old is gone, gone and the, the new, new is, is here. here. Amen.